today's uh, speaker, Alexander Martin, uh, grew up in Germany and France and received his a doctoral degree from the University of Pennsylvania in 1993. Uh, he taught at Oglethorpe University for 13 years, so it wasn't too hard to get him interested to come <laughs> back down uh, south. Um, and he's currently a professor of history at the University of Notre Dame. Um, his research focuses on Russia in the decades before and after 1812, and he's the author of Romantics, Reformers, Reactionaries, Russian Conservative Thought and Politics in the Reign of Alexander I, um, and also another work, Enlightened Metropolis, Constructing Imperial Moscow, 1762 to 1855. Uh, and he's working currently on a book project, The Nine Lives of Pastor Rosenstrasch, um, which is a, a, history, a kind of an immigrant family history of, in 19th century, early 19th century Russia. Um, so we're really delighted uh, to have Dr. Martin here with us, and please join me in welcome. Well, thank you very much. Can you all hear me in the back? I'm going to try to project. I've been on leave this semester. I always find when I start a semester and I haven't talked in front of a group of people in a while, Take, it's, it's like you're an athlete and you haven't exercised in a while, right? There's that sort of aspect. So if, if you can't hear me, let me know. Um, well, th I'm, I'm very honored to be invited to this Year of Russia program, where I've had a chance to look at the program. It's a very impressive thing that you all have, have going here. And so, like I said, I'm, I'm delighted to be able to be a part of it. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is what in Russia is simp known simply as 1812. So 1812 is the year of Napoleon's invasion in Russia. It's a huge red-letter date in Russian history. And I'll be talking partly about the, the war itself, but actually more widely about the impact that the memory of the war against Napoleon has had on Russian society. Because if you think of, say, the, the impact that the Civil War has had on American culture, or that World War II has had on American culture, the wars against Napoleon have had an impact somewhat like that on Russia. Um, so first of all, I want, by way of introduction, I want to say briefly, why is this war such a big deal? Right? Um, there's a couple of reasons that stand out to me why it's such a big deal. So I'll talk a little bit about that, and then I'll talk a bit about what actually happened in the war, so you have a sense of what this war is all about. Um, but let me start off with why it's such a big deal. First of all, it was a huge war, right? It was simply very big. Um, it was much bigger than anything that Russians had experienced in the 18th century. And so Russians experienced the, 18, the 1812 war as a real existential threat to themselves as a country. Um, have a look at these two maps. Ha, here we go. This is a map of 18th century Europe, right? So before the French Revolution, the things I'd like you to notice are, first of all, Russia is fairly far off in the east. Right, is separated from the rest of Europe by this huge Polish kingdom. And um, so that's, that's a basic point here. And most of the wars that Russia fought in the 18th century were fought in the territories of Poland or the Habsburg or the Ottoman Empire or somewhere in the German states. So in the 18th century, Russia fought a variety of wars on the territory of these foreign countries in order to secure specific types of political interests. 18, the, the wars against Napoleon were very different from that. This is what the map of Europe looks like by 1812. Right? This is the same map that we looked at before. What you'll notice is, Rus is Poland has disappeared, Russia has moved far to the west, and virtually everything west of Russia is controlled by Napoleon. Because on this map, everything in green is France. The light green is satellite states of France, including here this Grand Duchy of Warsaw and the purple is allies of France. So all of Europe west of Russia is controlled directly or indirectly by Napoleon, and Napoleon's army in 1812 follows that green line right there heading straight to Moscow. So this is simply much, much bigger than anything that Russians had experienced in the 18th century. And this massive existential threat to Russia in 1812 is followed by a huge march of the Russian army across Europe 
that leads them all the way to Paris. So the Russians, by the spring of 1814, are marching victoriously through Paris. So the, the biggest threat is followed by the biggest victory in Russian history. And that is one reason why, why 1812 is such a big deal. A second reason why it's a big deal is that it's Russia's first modern war. And in a sense, if you look at, eight, this is true not just for Russia, it's true for all Western countries. If you look at 18th century wars, they're typically fought over specific interests. Right? King A and King B are arguing over who gets some province, and they fight a war to settle that. But it's clear that this isn't about good versus evil. It's just about the interests of two states. What starts from the, from, from the French Revolution onward, wars in the Western world are thought of as wars not between kings, but between nations. And it's assumed that the war is somehow about an ideal of some kind. That we, the nation of X, stand for something, and we as a nation are threatened by whoever it is that we're fighting a war against. So that's a whole new way of thinking about wars. And for the Russians, 1812 is really the first time that that happens to them. But of course, right, you start thinking of wars as being between nations. Like, you know, these, the caricaturists sometimes capture that. You start to see Russia represented as a bear. You start to see Britain represented as a bulldog. These become fairly common themes in political cartoons. But basically, this raises the question, of course, of who are we as a nation? What kind of ideals do we have as a nation? Right? That's the Napoleonic period is the first time for most Western countries that they really confront this kind of question. So that's the second reason why 1812 is a big deal. The third reason is that, this, is that Russia in 1812 was, re, was led by fairly young men. And these, as if you look at the ministers, if you look at the, the generals, they're all fairly young, and the same people stayed in charge for decades afterwards. Right? If you look right here, this is, these are the top leaders of the Russian government around 1850. What you'll notice is they were all young men at the time of Napoleon. Which means, until the middle of the 19th century, Russia's leaders, their thinking is completely dominated by the experience of the Napoleonic Wars. That's their formative moment. They're still arguing about it. If you want to know what that's like, look at our own country today. We're still refighting the 1960s. <laughs> you know, and if you think about the impact that the 1960s have had ever since, because that same generation has dominated American life, Incidentally, if you haven't voted yet, go vote. It's important to vote. Politicians have to know that you care. Um, but you know, the same way that we've been dominated by the experiences of the 60s and 70s for decades, Russia is dominated by the experiences of 1812. A final reason, a final reason why 1812 was a big deal has to do with Russian culture. Right? These are four of the big iconic writers of early 19th century Russia, especially Pushkin, who you see right here. But if you looked at Russian literature, if you look at Russian painting, if you look at Russian music, if you look at Russian historical scholarship, there are a great many areas where modern Russian culture really gets started in the early 19th century. So if you study, if you, if you come into contact with Russian culture today, typically the oldest things that feel modern are from the early 19th century. And that means that the founding generation for much of modern Russian culture was people who were deeply shaped by the Napoleonic Wars. And they thought about the experiences of the Napoleonic Wars, and they brought that into their own cult, their own painting, their own music, their own literature, and that then created a pattern that later people followed. So there's, to, to wrap up this little introduction, there's a great book by a German historian about the history of 19th century Germany, and this author starts with at the beginning was Napoleon. That's how he starts his book on 19th century Germany. And in some ways, you could write that same title for a history of modern Russia, that at the beginning was Napoleon. So that's why 1812 is a big deal. Now, let me talk a little bit about what actually happened in the 1812 war. Um, this is who ruled Russia. This is Tsar Alexander I and his wife, Empress Elizabeth. And this, of course, is their antagonist Napoleon. Um, the very broad story is that before 1812, Russia and Napoleon had alternated between fighting wars 
and being uneasy allies. And at the beginning of 1812, there was an uneasy alliance between the Russians and Napoleon. But it was fairly clear that this alliance was not going to last long, or was not going to last forever, because of the attitudes from the two sides. On the one hand, what you have from the Russian side, right? From the Russian side, Napoleon, first of all, was an ideological threat, right? Napoleon had come, and you all may or may, may be familiar with this, Napoleon had come to power in France in the aftermath of the French Revolution. He had preserved an awful lot of the changes in French society that the revolution had brought about. And so from the standpoint of conservative European monarchs, which is basically all the other monarchs, Napoleon was the, was the successor to the revolution. So a Russian czar would feel about Napoleon the way an American president might have felt about Fidel Castro, right? As someone who ideologically is the enemy of our way of looking at things. So that's the first issue from the Russian side. The second thing, you'll remember the map that we saw before, and that we, yes, that we see again here. If you look at that map, Russia, any Russian leader looking at this map regarded the, the extent of French power as a huge security threat to Russia. But as far as, in Russian geostrategic thinking, the only way Russia was going to be secure in the West is if there was no major hostile power in Central Europe. That's why the Russians had benefited from having a big, weak Polish state. Once the big, weak Polish state was gone, because they carved it up, they were still okay with having a variety of medium-sized German states on their western side. What they didn't want was a huge, powerful French state. So from Russia's standpoint, Napoleon was unacceptable. Over the long term, Napoleon's power was unacceptable. What you have from Napoleon's side is Napoleon was fighting a war against most major European powers, but he could defeat all the land powers. But the French army was strong enough that no European army could stand up against it. Who he could not defeat were the British, because he couldn't get at their navy. So Napoleon was looking for ways to force the British to give up. And he thought that the British are never going to give up if they can expect a big ally to appear in Europe. And so as far as Napoleon was concerned, the Russians, he could tell the Russians were unhappy with the alliance with him. And as long as the Russians were there as unreliable allies, the British would have a reason to keep fighting. Because who knows, someday they could bring the Russians into the war. So from Napoleon's standpoint also, once it's clear that the Russians aren't going to accept French domination, then Russia becomes a threat, even in peacetime. So what happens in June of 1812, right, in June of 1812, Napoleon's army marches across the Russian border. Napoleon arrived with a huge army of 650,000 troops. Right, 650,000, that's an enormous army by early 19th century standards. Um, I'm going to refer to it as the French army, but that's actually oversimplifying it. Right, roughly half, because France didn't have that many soldiers, roughly half of Napoleon's army was actually French. The other half was made up of troops from all the various other European nations that were allies but with Napoleon or satellites or dominated by him. So roughly half the French army was actually made up of Germans, Poles, uh, there's a smattering of Italians and various others. And this fact that this is such a multinational army, that's important. I'll come back to that later on, but make a mental note of that. Now, Russia, everyone knows Russia's big and it gets cold. So you say, well, what idiot would invade a country that's where you face those conditions? Well, Napoleon wasn't stupid. He understood this, right? His calculation was the Russian czar can't afford to let me just run around in his empire, right? He's going to, because his, his power is going to weaken, his nobles are going to be hostile. He has to stop the French army near the border. So Napoleon figured the Russians are going to fight a big set of battles right by the border to stop this French invasion. The French army is much stronger than the Russian army, and that's true, it really was. We're going to smash the Russian army in a series of big battles, and once the Russian army is destroyed, the Russians are going to have to give up. And it doesn't matter that their country is big and cold, because we're never actually going to have to deal with that. That was essentially Napoleon's calculation. It was the usual strategy that he used against his European neighbors. The two countries against, it did, against which it didn't work is, first of all, Britain, because right, the British could run away back to their island and just hold themselves up. 
And the second country where it turned out that this didn't work was Russia. Because what happened is Napoleon invaded Russia, right? So this is, Prus this is the Kingdom of Prussia, which is a French ally. This is the Grand Duchy of Warsaw, that's a French satellite state. This is the Russian Empire right here. And these blue arrows are the advance of the Napoleonic army. What happened is, as Napoleon marched eastward, the Russians actually never stood and fought. There wasn't really a plan. It's not that the Russians had a deliberate strategy, but as the Russian commanders tried to figure out how to respond, they found that the most effective thing to do was to tr move eastward and not try to fight a big battle in which they would lose. So the French army spent the summer chasing the Russian army eastward. And the French moved much faster, much farther than Napoleon had actually expected. What happens, first of all, is as the armies move east, the French army shrinks, right, because soldiers, they die, they desert, they have to be left behind to, to guard supply bases. So the French army gets smaller as it goes east. The Russian army gets bigger, because the Russians, because as the Russians move east, they have time to mobilize more troops. So in that sense, time was clearly move, working against Napoleon, or space was moving against him. The second problem that happens is supplies. Right? Napoleon knew that Russia is a poor country in the sense that it's sparsely settled. And you know, typically, a Napole the way a Napoleonic army supplied itself was to live off the land, which essentially means you point a gun at the head of the peasants and say, give me your chickens. Right? And that meant you didn't have to bring along huge quantities of supplies. But Napoleon knew Russia is so sparsely settled, and my army is so big in 1812 that we can't do that. The Russian peasants don't have enough chickens to feed all these Frenchmen. So he, brought, he, he, store, he prepositioned huge supply magazines, but the French army advanced so fast that the supplies couldn't keep up. So as the French army advanced into Russia, they increasingly ran out of supplies. As they ran out of supplies, they did the only thing they could which is they extorted every last cow and every last chicken from the peasants. And as they did that, they earned the undying hatred of the Russian peasants. So Russian peasants, you know, the Russian peasants conceivably could have been Napoleon's allies. Right? Russian peasants were serfs. They mostly hated serfdom. Russian nobles were terrified that the peasants would rise up in revolt once Napoleon showed up. So there was a possibility that there could, that the Napoleon could find the Russian population on his side. That went sour really fast because of the, the you know, looting by French troops. And then in addition, the French troops, because of the anti-clerical tradition of the French Revolution, the French troops had a habit of vandalizing churches. So any Russian peasant who wasn't turned off by having to su surrender his supplies was really outraged when the pen French stabled their horses in the churches and used icons for target practice and, and that sort of thing. So anyway, the French army moves eastward until we finally end up at a place called Borodino, which I can't reach, but if you see Moscow right there, the big circle up on the top right, Borodino is just, just west of that. Um, here the Russians finally decided to stand and fight. At Borodino in August, you had what, I'd, what I've read, I can't guarantee this, but I've read that this was the bloodiest one-day battle ever in all of history, with something like 66,000 dead and wounded. So I don't know how this whether this is actually the biggest, bloodiest thing ever, but it was a huge battle. It was a huge battle, but it was a tactical draw. <coughs> that is, Napoleon's goal was to shatter the Russian army, and he wasn't able to do that. Right? The Russians kept retreating, but they retreated in good order. The Russian army stayed unified, it remained an effective fighting force. Once the Russians retreated from Borodino, they had essentially had to surrender Moscow. So Napoleon occupied Moscow, and his thinking, Napoleon's thinking was then, okay, I didn't really mean to go to Moscow, right? Napoleon wanted to win the war long earlier, but Moscow is a big, bustling, wealthy city, and here in this big city we can hunker down, we can stay here for as long as we need, because we have a city that can supply us, um, and we can just wait until the Russians eventually have to make peace, because they can't let us occupy their biggest city you know, forever. Well, as it turned out, most of the civilian population had fled Moscow, so Napoleon arrives and the city is empty. And almost as soon as the French moved in, a huge fire broke out that burned most of the city to the ground. 
This is a painting. There's lots of Russian paintings of the fire of Moscow. The fire of Moscow is one of those iconic events in 19th century Russian history. This is, you see the inside of the Kremlin. This is Napoleon, whom you can barely see with his generals. And they're looking out at the sea of flames that's consuming the city. Um, there's arguments to this day about who started the fire. Chances are it's basically some combination of accidents and deliberate arson by the Russian side. But the effect was that, first of all, Russian popular opinion was utterly outraged, because all the Russians blamed Napoleon for this. And secondly, the French now had no base to spend the winter, because they simply had a pile of rubble. And they're hundreds of miles away from the border. So Napoleon started putting out peace feelers to the Russians, and the Russian commanders weren't stupid. They encouraged him. They negotiated off and on with the effect that Napoleon stayed in Moscow for something like six weeks, hoping that peace was at hand. And then the Russians made clear that, no, we're not making peace. By now it's October, and Napoleon is in Moscow, hundreds of miles from his supply bases. And then it starts getting cold, and he realized we have to get out of here. And so what happens in November of 1812 is a catastrophic retreat of what's left of the French army across Western Russia. This is an awesome chart that was made by a French military scientist in the late 19th century. It shows three things. It shows, first of all, geography, right? It's a map. You go from the <coughs> western border of Poland here, where the French army came, all the way to Moscow. Secondly, it shows the size of the French army as it goes in and as it comes back out at various points. And thirdly, it shows the temperature at the same time. So by the time the French were here, at the beginning of December, temperatures were around 35 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. And you can see from the thickness of the lines how the French army had dwindled by the time they came back out. So the French froze to death. They were massacred by Russian troops that caught up with them. They were massacred by Russian peasants. So this is one of the great, terrible sort of episodes of military history is Napoleon's you know, disastrous retreat from Moscow to Lithuania. You remember Napoleon entered Russia with 650,000 men. He came out at the end with 22,000. So this, this is followed, so that's 1812. What f and this is a huge thing in Russian history. What follows is a f a something that Russians have virtually forgotten about. Nobody in Russia cares about that anymore. And that is a spectacular Russian campaign across Europe. Right, Napoleon quickly built up a big new army, but the Russians you know, conquered Poland, conquered Germany, marched into France, defeated Napoleon in a big series of battles, and by the spring of 1814, right, by the spring of 1814, the Russians and their allies were in Paris, and Napoleon <coughs> was overthrown. So like I said, this is an actually a huge event in military history is this campaign of 1813 and 1814. But in Russian culture, it gets treated completely as an afterthought. There is this big ca campaign abroad. What gets remembered is the 1812 war that happens in Russia itself. So this is basically what happens in the war. What I want to talk about with the time I have left is what impact this war had in Russian culture. Now, first of all, when you think back to the war, which war should you be thinking about? Tsar Alexander I wanted to think about 1813. Right? He was embarrassed by the fact that the French had marched all the way to Moscow. He was embarrassed by the fact that lots of peasants had participated in the war effort. He wanted to remember a successful war by the Russian Imperial Army. So to him, the 1813 campaign in Poland and Germany, that's what he wanted to remember. Everybody else in Russia focused on 1812. When, when they thought about 1812, this is the construction of a huge monument to both the war and to Alexander I in St. Petersburg. If you ever go to St. Petersburg, this is the Winter Palace, which is now the Hermitage Art Museum, and you'll see this enormous column in front of it with Alexander I in the shape of an angel on top of it. Um, so when Russians thought about 1812, there's a couple of big conclusions that virtually all educated Russians shared about 1812. A first conclusion was that Russia's very existence had been threatened by a massive European coalition. 
right? So Napoleon, but also the Poles and the Germans and the Italians, they'd all ganged up to destroy Russia. That stuck in people's memories. And therefore, Russians felt Russia has to have a stronger national identity. We have to rediscover our sense of inner Russianness. That's one thing that virtually all educated Russians agreed on after 1812. A second thing they agreed on is that the nobles and the peasants had to come closer together. Right? Traditionally, the nobles and the peasants lived worlds apart in Russian society. The nobles were culturally Europeanized, the peasants were not. The nobles were lords, the peasants were, sla were serfs. Um, but in 1812, many nobles came away feeling that the peasants had acted heroically and patriotically to defend their country. And so that somehow in the future, nobles and peasants had to, had to redevelop a bond. That's the second thing that everybody across educated Russia shared. Now, within that consensus, there are two separate narratives that developed about the war, two separate ways of interpreting these facts that I've just described. Because yes, Russians have to have a stronger national identity. Yes, nobles and peasants have to rediscover a bond. But what does that mean? Well, there are two, um, two narratives about this. One narrative is what you might call the conservative narrative. And I'll uh, I identify it here with Tsar Nicholas I. Nicholas I is the successor of Alexander. He's Alexander's brother. So he rules from 1825 to 55. That's Nicholas I, that's his wife Alexandra, and that's their son who later became Tsar Alexander II. The conservative narrative basically said this. What Russia is about is monarchy and Orthodox Christianity. Right? That's the core of Russia as a society. What Russians did in 1812 is defend that. As Russians didn't want some French revolutionary regime to come in and burn churches and who knows, do something about serfdom and challenge traditional ways. The Russian peasants had fought for their czar. They'd fought to restore their church. And so the lesson to learn from the war is that Russians need to redouble their commitment to a conservative, Christian, orthodox, monarchical vision of the world. That and that that's what Russianness is. That's the conservative narrative. There's a second narrative which I'm going to call liberal. The liberal narrative kind of says the opposite. Right? What the liberal narrative says is traditionally in Russia, the peasants get treated like immature children because they're serfs. Frankly, the nobles get treated that way too because they're subject to an absolute monarch. But in 1812, the peasants and the nobles showed that they are loyal citizens. Right? The nobles and the peasants fought for their country. They defended their czar. They didn't run away. They didn't defect to the French. Because the nobles and the peasants had fought bravely for their country, they deserved to be treated as citizens and not as serfs, not as subjects. So the logical outcome of the war would be, in fact, to abolish the absolute monarchy and introduce a freer political system where citizens have rights and where peasants are not serfs. It's a little bit like the argument in the civil rights movement in the 1950s that after African Americans fought for their country in World War II, they had a right to be equal citizens. It's a similar kind of argument that's being made here. So you have, my, the, my fundamental point is you have the same ideas about what happened in the war, but two really opposite interpretations. So the, the, the kind of emblematic figure of the conservative interpretation is Tsar Nicholas. The emblematic figures of the liberal interpretation are the people called the Decembrists. The Decembrists were a group of army officers who attempted a coup in December 1825. That's why they're called Decembrists, December. And the goal of the, the, this coup was suppressed. Here you see the imperial troops marching out to suppress the coup attempt. But the goal of the, the coup was to turn Russia into a much more liberal political system in which the peasants would not be serfs. So both of these things, both the conservative regime of Nicholas and the liberal vision of the Decembrists are both ways of making sense of the, the 1812 war. So we have these two narratives, the conservative and the liberal. And these narratives shape Russian culture going forward in a variety of different ways at different periods. So first of all, Nicholas II, Nicholas II, Nicholas I, reigned until from 1825 to 1855. 
Right, so a fairly long time, it reigned for 30 years. During those 30 years, until 1855, clearly the conservative narrative of the war dominated. Right, first of all, Russia was run by Nicholas himself and his conservative lieutenants who agreed with this vision. The former Decembrists had either been executed or been shipped off to Siberia. And they certainly, you couldn't publish books or, or, or newspaper articles that showed the Decembrist vision that what the war was really about was liberating the Russian people from their own internal oppression. Plus, Russia under Nicholas I was a tremendously powerful and stable state. And so if somehow, if you criticized the regime or said that 1812 meant that we should change society, the counter argument would always be, look at what a powerful, stable country we are. How can you say that we're doing anything wrong, right? The war, in fact, our, our power and our stability shows that we must be doing things right. So the conservative narrative is absolutely dominant uh, um, from 1825 on under Nicholas I. What happens then is the Crimean War. The Crimean War is in the 1850s. It's in the last years of Nicholas's life. What happens is that Britain and France inflict a massive military defeat on Russia. And the effect of this military defeat is that the entire Russian regime looks backward. So Russian public opinion comes to the conclusion that we lost the war not just because our military didn't perform as we would have liked to, but because our entire system of state and society has become backward. And of course that raised questions about the whole conservative narrative of the war, right? That, orth that, that autocracy and serfdom and so forth were becoming associated with backwardness. So what happens after the Crimean War, um, and you may have heard about this if you attended Professor Wirtschafter's lecture last week, was it last week? Okay. Is that there's a wave of liberal reform in Russia. So after the, from in the 1860s and 1870s, there's a wave of liberal reform. Serfdom gets abolished. There's less censorship. You know, citizens have more opportunities to take part in, to be involved in government and take part in public life. And that wave of reform coincides with the 50th anniversary of 1812, in 1862. Right, 50th anniversaries always prompt a lot of public discussions, speeches get held, memoirs get published, newspaper articles get written, guest lecturers get invited. And what happens in, the, in that context is a new emphasis on the liberal interpretation. And the most famous exponent of that is Leo Tolstoy. I wouldn't, politically, I wouldn't call him a liberal. He's more complicated than that. But Tolstoy's great work, War and Peace, which you see here in its original Russian form, these are original editions in foreign languages, here in English, there in German, because it became a big international hit. Tolstoy's, Tolstoy wrote essentially the definitive account of the 1812 war, and his core argument is the war was run by the Russian people. It wasn't, run by, it wasn't won by generals. So in that sense, and what the Russian people proved in 1812 is that they are a, a nation of mature, wise, capable people. They're not subjects who have to be kept under control by, by an elite. Um, so, these, so we have this conservative narrative and this liberal narrative. The liberal, uh, what happens in the 20th century is these themes remain very potent. Right? These themes of the 1812 war remain very prominent in Russian culture in the 20th century. First of all, Russia fights two huge wars in the 20th century, right? World War I and World War II. Now, World War I, I'm sorry, the, the, war of 18, the 1812 war in Russia is known as the Patriotic War. Patriotic War is how it's usually translated. It's actually not a great translation. A better translation would be War for the Homeland. This is a war that we're fighting for our existence as a country, as opposed to to promote some kind of interest. So the 1812 war is the Patriotic War. When World War I breaks out, it immediately gets declared to be the second patriotic war. Of course, World War I starts two years after the centennial of 1812. So 1812 is on people's minds. Um, so here, for example, you see this medal that was issued to people who donated to, the, you know, to help support the, the you know, injured soldiers. And it's labeled for the patriotic war of 1914. So World War I is explicitly linked to 1812. World War II even more so. World War II gets officially called in Soviet writing as the, is called the Great Patriotic War. But again, the assumption is this is like 1812. 
The Soviets produced lots of propaganda like what you see right here, where a clear linkage is made between Hitler and Napoleon. So on one side, so there's this, this is one way in which the legacy of 1812 lives on. Another way in which it lives on is the memory of the Decembrists, right, who of course you remember are the carriers of the liberal interpretation. The Decembrists have two big anniversaries in the 20th century, right, there's a 100th anniversary in 1925 and the 150th anniversary in 1975. In 1925 there's a big to-do about the anniversary. 1925 is eight years after the communist revolution, right, so communism was new and fresh and exciting in 1925. The communists were anxious to demonstrate that they were the legitimate successors of what was best in Russian history. And so what you see on these images here, and you could find many more like this, this is an iconic 19th century picture of the group of Decembrists who were executed for their, partici for their participation in the plot. And in the 1920s, these people get treated as kind of original Bolsheviks. Right? Where did the Russian revolutionary tradition begin? Right, the, begin right, the Decembrists were the original revolutionaries, and what they began, the communists have completed. That's essentially the in that sense, the Decembrists remain very relevant in the 1920s. Now fast forward to the 1970s, and you get a really cool movie called The Star of Captivating Happiness. In fact, it's a two-part movie. I think this may be the first, the first part. It's a movie about the Decembrists, and what it is, there, there's virtually no politics in it. It's all about how the Decembrists are, they're gentlemen, they're dashing, they're handsome, their wives are beautiful, they're all deeply in love, they're romantic, they're elegant, they have wonderful manners. And the context here is by the 1970s, communism was old and stale. The Soviet regime was clearly just authoritarian. There was a sense of grayness, of drabness, of coarseness about Soviet life. And in this context, the Decembrists were on the one hand dissidents, right? There were people who back in their day had stood up to power. And on the other hand, they were beautiful and elegant in a way that the Soviet present wasn't. So that actually the Decembrists remained relevant, but in a way that's very different from how they were in the 1920s. And of course, because the Soviet government had decided that the Decembrists are the original Bolsheviks, you could make these kinds of movies about them. Right? You could make these movies that subtly portray them in an un-Bolshevik sort of way because we've established that they're quasi-saintly figures. Um, after, after the Soviet Union collapsed, the, in some ways the conservative conception of 1812 made a comeback. There's the conservative conception that said that what 1812 is about is that Russia is a people with a strong state united by a shared faith. And a particular moment when they came back is in the late 1980s. For in the late 1980s, the Gorbachev reforms were undermining the communist regime. The Orthodox faith was making a comeback, and there happened to be the 1,000th anniversary of Russia's conversion to Christianity, which was in 1988. And that prompted an interest in an old cathedral. Right? If you look at this building up on the top left, that's the Cathedral of Christ the Savior. This is a picture from before the First World War. This Cathedral of Christ the Savior was built as a memorial to the Napoleonic Wars, or to 1812. Basically, it was built by the 19th century czars to give thanks to God for preserving the Russian Empire and defeating the French enemy. So it's a symbol, it's, it's really a, an architectural symbol of the conservative vision of 1812. That 1812 is about empire, it's about religion, it's not about freedom, it's not about democracy. The Soviets weren't big fans of churches. They thought they had better use for that space. So they demolished it in 1931. Right here you see it being blown up. And what they're going to put there is the biggest building on the planet. A huge skyscraper that was going to look like this with a huge Lenin statue on it. This is how big it was going to be relative to the Empire State Building, relative to the Eiffel Tower. Um, so this enormous sort of Soviet socialist building was going to be put there instead. But it turned out they never really got anywhere with it because they started building it in 1937. But then World War II broke out, and they had more urgent issues. They ran out of funding. The building is close to the river, and they had flooding problems. And 
finally, in the mid-50s, architectural tastes changed, and people of the Soviet Union just didn't build that style of building anymore. So finally, what they did is they put a big swimming pool there instead. So there's a huge swimming pool. You can see the Kremlin off in the distance. So they had this big swimming pool, and that's where, in the late 1980s, this, this petition was launched to rebuild the old cathedral. And then in the 1990s, the cathedral was rebuilt. So if you go back, to, if you go to Moscow today, you see the old cathedral again as a rebuilt monument to the conservative vision of 1812. And that is because the post-Soviet Russian state had a need for this. Right? Russian governments, Russians have always had the sense that a country has to have an idea. Right? A country has to have a purpose. It, can't, it doesn't just exist. It exists for some kind of purpose. And the question then is, what is that purpose? For most of the 20th century, the purpose clearly was to build socialism. But once socialism, once the Soviet system was gone, a new purpose had to be found. And one place to go to look for that purpose was the traditions of 19th century nationalism. So the Russian government from the 1990s on began encouraging Russian nationalism. They began building Orthodox churches. They tried to revive that sense that what we are is a kind of continuation of the Russian Empire. And this brings me to my final couple of points, which is that there are some big ideas, some big themes that run through the whole long tradition of how Russians have thought about 1812. And these ideas, you, you see them beginning back in the late 19th century, and they, in the early 19th century, and they continue right down to the present. In fact, one way you see this is this President Putin there in the middle. If you look at his honor guard, they're wearing essentially Napoleonic style uniforms. Right? And they only dressed them that way in 2006. So you can see there's a deliberate effort to reconnect symbolically with the traditions of the early 19th century. So there's a couple of big ideological themes, and I want to emphasize these themes are not inherently right wing or left wing. These are ideas that can be used to support left wing ideas or to support right wing ideas. A first set of concepts has to do with national identity. Right? The war brought up the question of what kind of country is Russia? What does it mean to be Russian? And I think there's two things that come out of this idea, this question of what it, does it mean to be Russian. First of all, Russia, as you probably know, is and always has been a multinational country. It's a country of many different ethnicities. And it's a country that historically has been governed by an upper class that looked to the West and was interested in somehow becoming more Western. Right, so it's multinational and governed by a Western-oriented upper class. One of the legacies of 1812 is the thought that Russia should be, th that the core of the Russian state is the Russian common people. Right, the core of the state is not the westernized upper class. It is not the other nationalities. It is specifically the Russian common people. That means, first of all, it's a rejection of the 18th century idea that the core of the state is the westernized nobles. It's also a rejection of any kind of melting pot idea. Right? If you look at what happened in the United States, the English settlers who came here gave up their Englishness to merge with other European and then eventually other nationalities in a kind of American melting pot. So the idea was to become American, you give up your sense of being English. In Russia, certainly from 1812 on, nobody would argue that Russians should give up their Russianness to, to merge with the other peoples of the Russian Empire. So this is a, this idea that the Russian state is fundamentally about the Russian people is something that originates in 1812. This has democratic implications, right? You can use this idea to make the argument that therefore we, the Russian people, want rights. We want liberties, right? We want to be treated well. So there's a democratic implication. There's also an anti-democratic implication, right? If you look at the arguments that the Putin government often makes, It'll basically say all the people who are, all the people in Moscow and St. Petersburg who criticize me for being an authoritarian, those are just westernized people who aren't true Russians. Right? The true Russians are the ones who support me. And if you want more Western style democracy, then you're un-Russian. Right? So this idea that the Russian state is about the Russian common people, it can, be, can lead to more democracy, it can lead to less democracy. The second aspect of what this does to Russian national identity I learned about when I had a conversation with a 
group of Russians back in 1990 or 91 in some late evening in a Leningrad apartment. And I'll talk about the statue in a moment. And I was talking to them, and somehow we got in this conversation. I said, you know, you Russians, what do you think is special about you? Like Americans think that Americans are individualists and they're, they're freedom loving, right? And the Germans and the French, they all have some idea about themselves. You Russians, what do you think is, is, is Russian? And the immediate answer was, we know how to suffer. We are capable of martyrdom. We are capable of suffering in a way that Westerners are not. And I'm putting the statue up because it reflects that. These are the Decemberist wives. The Decemberist wives, that's what they're always called, were a dozen wealthy aristocratic women who were married to officers who participated in the Decemberist revolt. And when their husbands were sentenced to exile in Siberia, these women willingly gave up all of their privileges and went along with their husbands. Because they said, you know, love comes first, I don't care how much I have to suffer. Right? And that, they encapsulate a certain Russian conception of what Russians are like. And this comes out of the experience of the collective suffering of 1812. Now this idea that that's what's special about Russians has become part of how Russians think. It can be like the idea that Russia is about the Russian people. This can be directed against the state, right? Because after all, the Decemberist women suffered because they were oppressed by the Russian state. So the idea that Russianness is about the capability of suffering can be an implicit accusation against a Russian state that treats us badly. But it also can be, some, it can also be used for xenophobic purposes. So for instance, if you ask Russians about World War II, a common thing you'll hear is D-Day only happened in 1944 because the British and the Americans were basically too selfish and cowardly to fight, and they were willing to let Russians bear the brunt of all the fighting. Right? So there's a sense that, that Russians, because Russians have this ability to suffer, and because they have suffered, that Westerners, by contrast, are not like that, because Westerners are somehow callous and selfish. So there's a, it's, it's a complicated concept, just like the idea of Russia being about the Russian people is a complicated concept, but these are things that come out of the 1812 war. A final point I want to make about the implications, the sort of persistent ideas about 1812 that influenced Russian, Russian thinking. A final point has to do with Russia's relation with the West. You'll remember I said before that Napoleon had this big multinational army. And every Russian memoir you read from the Napoleonic Wars tells you that. There were the Germans and the French and the Poles and the Italians and everyone else. So all of Europe invaded us. What that left with is Russians, it left Russians with a persistent sense that, that sometimes the entire West gangs up on us. And we are, we, we're not just one European country having conflicts with another one, but they all hate us and they will all come together to attack us. It's not a persistent thought all the time, but periodically this surfaces. So it surfaces, um, it surfaced very strongly in World War II when there was a sense that Hitler led a big multinational coalition against the Soviet Union. It surfaces again today, right, in, in the context of NATO expansion. So if you look at this map here, this is what NATO looked like at the end of the Cold War. This is all the East European countries that had joined NATO afterwards. Many Russians think that this is a deliberate attack by the entire West against them. And this is a cartoon that I found just the other day in the Russian press. Right, it shows, this is the symbol of NATO, so it shows NATO extending its tentacles farther and farther east toward Russia. <coughs> and here you see the Russian bear who really just wants to be left alone, but notice what's in his box. All the past tentacles of monsters that he chopped off, including 1945 with a swastika and 1812. In other words, there clearly is a, a pattern that one of the ways that Russians can see their international relations is as a concerted attack on us by the West. And from time to time, that idea resurfaces. This is usually associated with the idea that this Western coalition is led by whoever the big dog is in the West. So first it's the French, in the 20th century, for early 20th century it's the Germans, in the late 20th century it's the Americans, today it's NATO and the European, and the European Union. But whoever the really big power in the West is, is standing behind this. But that big power is aided by some kind of disloyal East European people. That's another theme that's persistent. In the Napoleonic invasion, that's the Poles. 
But every Russian memoir about 1812 will tell you about the evil Poles, who were Napoleon's allies. In the later 19th century, it's still the Poles, but also the Jews. So the big theme about the Jews conspired against Russia. The form in which you get that today, where right, this is about the Poles, these are from the Soviet-Polish War of 1919-1921. This is a Soviet poster that says that Poland is basically the attack dog of the Western allies. This says Poland is a pig that's been created by France. Right? And this is then what the Polish nobles, how they want to enslave the Russian peasants. But the argument is that the Poles are simply the agents of the West. And the current incarnation of this is the Ukrainians. So if you look at some of the, the sort of Russia, stuff you get in the Russian press about Ukraine, this, these are things I just found on the internet. Right? This shows a sort of Russian and a Ukrainian represented by these little girls. The one in the back is Russia, the one in the front is Ukraine. And over here you have the Americans and the Germans and some other Westerner. And these are the stars of the European Union. And so the idea is Ukraine should be Russia's friend, but look at what the West, the West is capable of seducing them. What this down here shows, this is a Ukrainian. This is a typical sort of way that Russian cartoonists will represent Ukraine. He's, to Uncle Sam, he's handing Western and Eastern Ukraine on a platter. And Uncle Sam says, and where's the Crimea? Because right, of course the Russians have just annexed Crimea, and that's the other piece that, that Uncle Sam still wants. But so this idea of a Western conspiracy against Russia, where the, the, the spearhead of it is some sort of East Europeans, that is a theme that you get, it's not all the time, but when there's big international crises, this is an idea that can bubble to the surface in Russian thought. And where the Russians see themselves in this context is the Russian, and this is the final thing the Russians get out of 1812, is, you know, you remember in 1812, the Russian monarchs saw themselves as defending the traditional European order against the French who were overthrowing the traditional European order. So there's an idea that develops that even though we Russians aren't really part of Europe, at the same time, we're actually more European than the Europeans, because we're standing up for monarchy and Christianity against these French people who are overthrowing it. You get that idea persistently ever since. Right? Then in the later 19th century, Russia still represents itself as the defender of traditional monarchical Christian values against Western liberalism. In the 20th century, the Russians represent socialism as the, the logical path of the entire West, but only Russia is the country that's actually taking this path, and the West is resisting. What you get today often from President Putin's government is the argument that Russia is standing up for traditional Christian values, which the West is not. So the, the introduction, say, of gay marriage in the, in the West has gotten a huge amount of publicity in Russia as a sign of the West's decadence that the West has abandoned traditional Christian European moral values and only Russia is still upholding that. So even though Russia is on the outside of Europe, in some ways it remains, it sees itself as actually more Western than the countries that are actually the West. So the upshot of all this, there's big annual reenactments that Borodino know every year to recall the, the big battle. The upshot of all this is what the Russians get out of 1812 is a feeling that they are very much part of European civilization, but at the same time it, that they're on the one hand perhaps morally superior to the West, and yet also that they're often used and underappreciated by the West. And I think I'm running out of time, so thank you very much. Great, we have time for questions. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I want to thank you for a very uh, clear presentation. Uh, I, want, I want you to give you a chance to compare uh, conservatism in the early 19th century in Russia and Central Europe. Um, I'm particularly thinking about um, national, like how nationalist the, the Russian conservatives are versus, say, the other two members of the um, Holy Alliance, who tend, the Russia and Prussia, Prussia, Prussia and Austria. And Austria tend to be anti-nationalist because the liberals and radicals are, are nationalists. But maybe in Russia there's more nationalism amongst the conservatives like Alexander the First? That's an interesting question. And the answer is, I mean, yes, the Prussians and the Austrians were completely anti-nationalist, right? Because for those who aren't, aren't up on this, basically the, only, the logical nationalism in Prussia would be German nationalism. Uh, 
And German nationalism would mean that Prussia would be submerged in some kind of larger Germany. And in Austria, nationalism would mean that the different na ethnicities of the empire would start drifting apart. So both the Prussians and the Austrians, the governments were very anti-nationalist. The Russian government was torn about this because it, it, Russia had a clearly dominant nationality, right, which is ethnic Russians. And Prussia and Austria didn't have that. On the, and the Russian government also knew that to appeal to the common people, some sort of nationalistic rhetoric could be useful. On the other hand, the Russian government was full of ethnic foreigners. Um, if you remember the, the, right, the picture I showed of Nicholas I and these various other people, right, who were his people working with him. So Nicholas's wife was a Prussian princess. The foreign minister Nesselrode was a German. The general on their, oh wait, Paskevich, I'm not sure where he's from, but it's a Polish sounding name. But if you looked at the Russian elite, right, a lot of them came from other countries. A lot of them talked to each other in French rather than in Russian. Um, in addition, Russia itself was a multi-ethnic state. So the Russian government was very hesitant about endorsing the idea of, of nationalism because because it bothered them personally and because they were afraid it would split the empire. What tended to happen in Russia, and that was true back then and has happened ever since, is that <coughs> Russian nationalism essentially comes in two different forms. Right? There's an ethnic nationalism, which says to be Russian means to be Slavic and orthodox and have these cultural qualities. And this kind of ethnic nationalism is often anti-government because it'll end up saying that we are governed by people who are out of touch with our true ethnic essence because they're they're westernizers. And so Russian governments have never really been comfortable with ethnic nationalism. The other brand of Russian nationalism says that Russia fundamentally is a big powerful empire that has a certain makeup and you're Russian if you're a really good loyal citizen and supporter of that. And so you could be a Russian and still maybe at home speak some other language as long as you're loyal to the empire. It's a little bit closer to American nationalism which might say we don't care that much about your ethnic ancestry as long as you share our vision of what the country should be. And that kind of nationalism Russian rulers were okay with. So I think it depends on what sort of nationalism you're talking about. Yes, and by the way, if you're, if, just say, if you're in the back and you want to raise your hand, really wave because you're kind of, it's dark back there and I can't see much. Yes, so yes ma'am. Sort of popular or, nationalism. Or it's a tricky question. And part of the problem there is that we don't have terribly good evidence for how most people thought or, or behaved. I mean, if you had gone to most, let's say, Russian peasants in 1812 and asked them, do you feel like you're members of a Russian nation, they, w that they wouldn't have known what you're talking about. That would have been a foreign language to them. But if you had said, are you loyal to the Russian czar? Yes. Are you an Orthodox Christian? Yes. How do you feel about people in f European clothes and who talk foreign languages? Eh. Yeah, so they would have had an instinctive sense of themselves as an Orthodox community ruled by a Russian czar who were somehow different from all these foreigners who they had in Russia. So at that, l at that level, I think a kind of nationalism was very widespread among among the common people. Uh, um, it, it's something that the Russian government had to be careful about tapping into because the, the first, the, the most of the French speaking people you saw in Russia were Russian nobles. So that the government had to be really cautious about arousing these kinds of, these kinds of feelings. What you have among educated Russians is a strong sense of pride in, in Russia as a great powerful empire. What wasn't as obvious is how this ties in with a sense of of Russian ethnic and cultural identity. So does being proud of being Russian mean I shouldn't talk French anymore? Right, that is something, that wasn't organic. That's a gradual process that's accelerated by 1812. That educated Russians start to say, being Russian means I should speak Russian, I should take an interest in Russian cuisine and, and that sort of stuff. Does that sort of answer your question? Yeah, I, I guess I was trying to compare it to what was happening in this country in the 19th century. Well, Russia, I think Russia on one level had a much lower educational level. 
So there's the, I think then the United States. So many fewer people would have been touched by what was taught in schools, by what was written in books. Right? That's limited to a smaller group. I think also when nationalism develops through, through printed, can I close this door? Okay. When it develops, I can do it. When, when nationalism develops through books and newspapers and the arts and all of that, sorry, in the 19th century, what it tends to be like is that it emphasizes a sense of cultural Russianness that comes from the common people. And, and my sense, I'm not as up on the American case, but I think that that's probably different. So there's a sense of you know, Russian folk songs. What are traditional foods of Russian peasants? What are you know, the, the traditional folk arts that go back centuries? So it's more like the kind of nationalism that you might have gotten in Germany or in Ireland, where there's an assumption that there's deep centuries old folk traditions and we want to build a modern culture around that. But separately, what was a force officially encouraged is loyalty to the Tsar. So if nationalism means I am loyal to the monarch, I am proud of the empire, you, know, you prayed for the Tsar every Sunday in church. And you know, that would be officially encouraged. And the yeah. Decembrists who were sent to Siberia were part of that forefront, weren't they, of sort of rediscovering Russian, uh, the multi-ethnic traditions of Russia in, in a sense of being in Siberia mm -hmm. and learning and trying to bring that back. Yes, yes, absolutely. Right, so the Decembrists very much participate in this because their conception, or the moment, as you all might know, to be a national, to be in the 19th century, if you were liberal, you're usually a nationalist, right? Because the traditional view of society is we are a monarchy, our society is defined by our king, and what makes us a people is that we all obey our, the same king. In the liberal vision, the people are supposed to govern, and that means we have to figure out who the people are and we have to be loyal to our people. So nationalism is originally a liberal concept, and the, the Decembrists, in fact, and their political ideas were much more intolerant toward ethnic minorities than the Russian czars were. But the czars were perfectly fine with having subjects of different nationalities, as long as they're all loyal. Right? The Decembrists and Russian liberals were much more nationalistic, because they said Russians actually have to be a community, because otherwise they can't work as a, as a country of citizens. Yes, sir? From the, the themes that you described, it almost seems like they didn't get credit for their participation in World War II. I mean, they had 25 million casualties by far, the most of anybody. And it's like, you kind of never hear about, you know, not to the same level of, you know, description and content of, it sort of goes along the same theme that's like, you don't hear of them getting, you know, recognized as having the biggest losses in, you know, the biggest war. This is in the West. Yeah, in the West, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's absolutely true. It's a little bit less true today, I think, than it would have been 20, 30 years ago. But, but definitely there's a tendency, oh, oh look, and I, I think it's sort of, it's natural at two levels, right? One is that everybody who went through World War II emphasizes their own part, right? Because frankly, if we lost 100,000 people, that's a bigger deal to us than if some foreigner lost a million. So there's, it's a natural response to that. And then in the Cold War context, right, once the Soviets became our enemy, it obviously didn't make sense to start giving them a lot of historical credit. Yeah. And, and I think in addition, most, this is my impression, that most Westerners who study World War II traditionally don't know Russian. So that I think, as far as I know, I'm not an expert on this, but as far as I know, uh, say, English language accounts of the war on the Eastern Front in World War II. As far as I know, those are largely based on German sources, or the, the memoirs of German generals, that sort of thing, because Western historians could read those. And the German generals were just like Napoleon, uh, our books about, Nap about the Napoleonic Wars are the same way. You look at most traditional English language books about Napoleon's Russian campaign, the primary sources are all French. And what both the German and the French generals did is they obviously didn't want to come out and say, we lost because the enemy fought better, right? Because that would be awkward. So what they say is, we, you know, we would have won, but then the country was so darn big, and, and it <laughs> snowed so much. And, you know, I mean, so they'll tend to, there's this, this persistent trope that we were militarily better, but we were defeated by the elements. And I think that that migrated into the, the, the Western scholarship. It migrated from German and, and, Russia and French memoirs 
into Western scholarship and into Western popular perceptions. So some of the newer literature about the 1812 war argues that actually in some ways the Russians had a better army than the French did. Right? Better command, better discipline, that just in certain ways, that just, just unit by unit, they were actually superior. Yeah, we can add to that that, of course, it's cold, but the Russians are also fighting. Right, the Russians are also cold. So, you know, yeah, yeah, but what you have then is, is an additional thing, that there's a long tradition in the West. And what the West is, that's a complicated thing in itself. But in the West of regarding East Europeans as somehow less civilized. Right, we think of the whole trope in, in America historically of Polish jokes. Right, you don't get an equivalent of English jokes or Dutch jokes, but they tell the jokes about the Poles. Everybody in Europe, west, from Germany on westward, they all traditionally think that Eastern Europe is somehow dark and dirty and primitive, and, and that the people there are, some, are just fundamentally less civilized. And that's an idea that goes back to the 18th century. It, of course, tied in beautifully with German propaganda in World War II, and then with Western propaganda in the Cold War. And the consequence is that if the Russians lose a lot of people, that somehow doesn't seem as real. I mean, I think if 20 million British people had died in World War II, it would be easier in America to grasp that as a tragedy than 20 million Russians. I mean, frankly, we can't pronounce their names. We've never heard of the cities where they live. We imagine it's all snow anyway. So I think, I think that adds to why, why there's that perception. And Napoleon's general is right in the same terms. I remember in one French memoir, there's a question of this general, French general says, huh, I've noticed that wounded French soldiers groan more than wounded Russian soldiers. Why is that? Must be that the Russians just don't feel pain the way we do. And that was that sort of perception that the Russians, they just don't feel pain. They're not bothered by the cold in the winter because they're not sensitive human beings like we are. That's a kind of persistent undertone, I think, of, of historically of these kinds of discussions. Yes, sir? Oh, I'm sorry, man. Yeah. So you can speak a little louder. It's okay. hard to hear down here. The effects of the 1812 war has um, <coughs> Russia's interest in the Syrian the In the... Syrian Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm pausing because I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking about it. Um, in a certain direct sense, no. Right. Um, because the Syrian war is clearly one about influence in the wider world and not anything about a threat to the immediate Russian homeland. Um, and, and Russians don't have a very strong, traditionally strong opinion about Syrians or Arabs. But in a, in a broader sense, um, the idea that Russia, there's a certain very hard, cynical view of international relations, that everyone's out to get us. So we have to stand up for every interest that we have anywhere. I, th I mean, my impression is that that's what's going on in Syria. And 1812 certainly feeds into that. Um, and it probably does in other ways, too, that aren't coming to me right this moment. If I tried long enough, I'd probably find all kinds of connections. <laughs> but that's the, well, well, no, actually, one other connection is, I, I will put this forward, is one of the consequences of the development of Russian nationalism is a reflection on, is Russia really part of Europe? Right, and this is, if you want, you can get a discussion. If you tell, ask Russians, is Russia part of the West? Boom, you've started a discussion that'll go on all night, right? That's a, that's a perennial favorite. And one of the arguments you'll get is we're not really European, and that's because we're part of some sort of larger European, Asian border zone. And therefore, Russia has, a legitimate, has an important legitimate place in the East, whatever that might be, because Russia isn't completely part of Europe. And what is related to that then is a long tradition of Russia asserting interests in the Middle East. And in the Muslim world, that comes out of all kinds of reasons, but one thing it comes out of is this perception of Russia itself as kind of European and kind of not. That's why the Russian government in, in the last years set a close relationship with Turkey for some of the same reasons, because they see Turkey as being kind of in the West and kind of not, and therefore a logical partner for themselves. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you.